Talking about the things that matter most to you. Today's Catholic Women. Catholic Women Now with Julie Nelson and Chris McGruder is underwritten by Fred Haas. Over 30 years helping injured Iowans recover losses from accidents and work-related injuries. Fred Double D, Haas Double A. Learning Rx, finding the right solution to give your child a foundation that can last a lifetime. And Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte, a licensed representative of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. CindySchulte.com. Well, welcome everybody to the show today. I'm Julie Nelson. Good morning. I'm Chris Magruder. Well, we're glad that you all chose to spend some time with us this morning here around the Catholic Women Now coffee table or tea table or, or I was going to say, I'm grabbing my tea. I'm grabbing my tea, yeah. grabbing my tea yeah, today. You're not a coffee drinker, are you? Oh, I like coffee, but I'm trying to stay away from it. So. I'm trying to, I don't drink coffee when it gets warm out and it's finally getting warmer, mm-hmm. um, but I do like my Diet Coke, so I have to be careful with so that. So welcome, welcome summer and Diet Coke. Yeah, and I know that's worse <laughs> for you than coffee from what I I know, I know. You know what Coke can do for just a car engine, Julie. So imagine what it's doing to your body. (laughs) Yeah, I don't want to think about that. All right, so (laughs) I need to get my uh, pistons and everything cleaned out then, huh? (laughs) Drinking Diet Coke. Maybe we should maybe we should start with prayer about that. (laughs) Yeah. All right. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today on the show, well, we have Elizabeth Ficacelli joining us. She's been a frequent guest here at Iowa Catholic Radio, and she's been on our show before. And today she's going to talk to us about St. Faustina Divine Mercy, which we just had Divine Mercy Sunday. Mm. So we're kind of having Divine Mercy Week here, yes. continuing on and learning a little bit more about St. Faustina and more some, some interesting things about the devotion of the Divine Mercy. So I'm excited and to you know, I, we, talk to her. We had a show on Divine Mercy and St. Faustina a few years ago, and I, I still have my notes, which I love, because it's always good to be reminded of the mm-hmm. power of this. You know, I, I get into a good habit of saying Divine Mercy, and then something will happen, and I'll get out of the habit again. So it's good to have these reminders. I know. Really. I enjoyed reviewing it again, too. Mm-hmm. I needed that review as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, so. but her book that we're going to be talking about is called Therese, Bernadette, and Faustina, Three Saints Who Challenged My Faith and Gave Me Hope and Taught Me How to Love. Yeah. So she's going to have a lot of wisdom for us, I have She feeling. does. Well, she does anyway, so she's a great, great guest to have yes. on. So stay with us. Stay yes. with us here. Yes. Okay. Well... Should we talk a little bit about our Mary Walk coming I up in May? I know. Excited. Share those details, Well, girl. so, you know, we all know that May is, month, is the month dedicated to Mary, the Blessed Mother, and uh, it culminates on the Feast of the Visitation on May 31st. And so we are doing our Catholic Women Now sponsored third annual Walk with Mary to Elizabeth's house. So yeah, I can't believe it's our third one. It's going to be exciting. I know. It's exciting. It gets bigger every year. It gets bigger every year. It so we are, it's 80 miles from um, the Mary's home in Nazareth to Ein Karim, where Elizabeth lived. So we're asking all of you to walk the 80 miles and pray the rosary every day for our country and for any personal attentions. And gather a group and pray once a week and walk once a week and pray the rosary together. I know we had groups that did that last year. The the, the team of gals from the well, they called themselves the wellies. They walked once a week. <laughs> and uh, we tried to join as many as we could. But if you can't, grab a neighbor, yeah. whatever. We're going to have more details of that on the website at Iowa Catholic Radio. Spread the word and join us. And if you can't join us every time, it's okay if you come just once or twice or if you can come every time. And you know what? If you don't have a friend, we'll be your friend. Yeah. We'll be new friends. You'll yeah. be meeting new friends, new community by we'll, joining us. And we'll ha- we have a Facebook group set up for it so you can share your photos, your, your thoughts, any inspirations, as well as any prayer intentions so that mm-hmm. we all can pray together for each other and lift, us, lift each other up. And we'll have a, we're going to have a celebration on May 31st. It happens to fall on a Thursday this year. So we'll have a very ending celebration celebrating those who were able to make the 80 miles and just celebrating Mary and the whole the whole beautiful thing of the rosary yeah. and the yeah. It'll be prayers, in, are we going to have little awards like last I, I year? I think so we should. We okay. gave out awards last yeah. year. Let, so. Oh, the gold miraculous medal is what yeah. somebody The gold medals. That was cool. They that were the gold really cool. medals. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, we need to say thank you to Cindy Schulte of Farm Bureau Financial Services for underwriting Catholic Now. She is an authorized independent agent. She and her team provide health care, excuse me, health insurance options from Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. And she's here to make insurance simple for you. She's definitely committed to helping us prepare our futures and protect what matters most. So let her help you through any stages of life. She can be found on the web at cindyschulte.com or 515 515- 
226-2111. Well, we welcome today to the show Elizabeth Ficacelli. She's an inspirational Catholic speaker, and she can be seen and heard frequently on Catholic radio and television, including guest hosting live national radio programs such as Catholic Connection and Cresta in the Afternoon. And Elizabeth hosts her own program, Answering the Call on St. Gabriel Catholic Radio. Yeah, she's a big star. Yeah, in which she interviews <laughs> priests, deacons, religious about their spiritual journeys. And in addition to her speaking and media work, Elizabeth is a best-selling award-winning author with oh, 15 books amazing. to her credit, including the book we're, she's coming going to speak to us about today, Therese, Bernadette, and Faustina, Three sta- Saints Who Challenged My Faith, Gave Me Hope, and Taught Me How to Love. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Good morning, ladies. It's great to be here as always. Oh, oh. We're, we're glad to have you here with us. You know, interestingly enough, some of our listeners may not know who St. Faustina is or not know much about her. So could you give us a little bit of an introduction to who St. Faustina is? Sure. She would be considered a, a more of a modern saint in that she lived in the 1900s. And um, really her claim to fame was in the 1930s, uh, like about 1930 to 1938, uh, she had these visions of, of Jesus. And the whole theme of the visions was his divine mercy. Um, he had chosen Faustina uh, out of all people of all times to be what he called his secretary of mercy, that he wanted her to you know, write down what she was uh, being instructed to do all about his mercy. And, you know, the truth is, Faustina really, um, her first uh, uh, connection with God really came as a child. She was about seven. She had a mystical experience and she felt the Lord calling her, you know, to religious life for his own. But because she lived in a a large uh, farming family and a very poor farming family in Poland, um, they did not, the parents really didn't support that. They, They didn't know religious sisters. There weren't any in the village. If you wanted to become a religious sister, you'd have to go to one of the big cities, you know, like Warsaw or so. And since they didn't really know religious sisters and and she was needed to help around the house, she was one of the older of the 10 children. She was like the third oldest. Um, So they didn't support her when she uh, had these encounters and as a teenager felt called again. Um, And so how she ended up as a religious is she was um, attending a dance with her sister and Jesus actually appeared to her. It was the first apparition, first vision she had. And he was the suffering Jesus and he was saying to her, you know, how long are you going to make me wait? Um, he told her to to go to, um, well, first of all, she left the dance. She went to a cathedral and he appeared again and he instructed her to go to Wa- Warsaw. And that's where she would go. And eventually she would get herself into the congregation uh, for the Sisters of Mercy and, and became this very devout, very pious um, nun. But again, just a very simple, this is so typical of so many of our saints, not a big education. So she had simple roles like doorkeeper and cook and and simple tasks. She was also moved around often to the different uh, houses that the congregation had in Poland. And all of that really played out to her benefit because she was having all these mystical experiences and no one knew about it. I mean, none of the other sisters, the only ones who did know about her mystical encounters Uh, like would be her superiors and they all thought she was delusional (laughs) they thought she was crazy you know that this was okay this couldn't be you know I I have to say I have to say Elizabeth I'm kind of coveting the fact that God's telling her what her next step is what she should be doing in life I mean I think how many of us would like to have Jesus just come to us and tell us you know here's what she should do next wow I know and and truthfully yeah and and, but it was one step at a time you know first he told her to go to Warsaw and he didn't say go to you know 952 Elm Street he didn't say that. He just said, go to this city. She had never been to this city before, you know, never left home before. So here she was 18 or whatever, mm-hmm. and she's in this big city. But she she comes across this woman. Of course, this is the Lord put this woman in her path and the woman took her in so she could start looking for uh, places. And then she did find this this one congregation of mercy that did take her in. But they said she had to work a year, build up a dowry. So she had to do that, you know, do house cleaning and so forth to, to earn some money to to get her admittance into this congregation. But she didn't, she wasn't told at seven years old, you're going to be my secretary of mercy. He did reveal it one stage at a time. Mm, But I do agree with you, Chris. I know it it would be really nice (laughs) if he gave us a little more of a blueprint. (laughs) You know, God is so good at at being merciful and giving us the process rather than just, you know, shoving it down our throats. Here's what you will do. He allows us to walk through the process. I think that's part of his mercy. 
He does. And that takes faith and trust in us and trust, trust, trust. That's a big part of this message. Jesus, I trust in you. That comes out of this devotion. Mm -hmm. Uh, But so that was really her claim to fame is that uh, she would become the secretary of of divine mercy. And she suffered greatly, as as all saints do, who have very important tasks for the Lord. But uh, she suffered because people thought in her community that she was a little odd. the, The superiors thought she was truly delusional. The confessors, you know, they didn't believe her at first. And then finally, Father uh, Michael Sapochko is assigned to her. And that's who God had chosen to be her confessor. And, you know, he will finally support her and encourage her to actually write down everything. And that's where the diary comes from. But she suffered. I mean, it was not she did not have an easy life, um, suffered physically, spiritually, emotionally. But she had a huge task. Yeah, that is, it is a big task, um, the Divine Mercy Devotion. So what is the Divine Mercy Devotion that kind of came out of her diaries? Well, you know, the message of mercy is not anything new. You know, Julia, the, the message of mercy has been around since the church was around, since Jesus was around. He was always talking about mercy. But what the devotion of divine mercy does is gives us kind of like new channels to receive that mercy that's so readily available to us that the world had really forgotten. And that's why he appears in the 1930s. And of course, that's a turbulent time over in Europe. You have yeah, Hitler is marching through Europe, mm-hmm. invading Europe and Poland is about to fall. Um, then the communists will come in. And it's just a, just a very dark time in history, a very hopeless time in history. And yet um, this is when Jesus uh, elects to come and remind us of this mercy. So he gives us all these different uh, ways to receive it. Uh, he teaches her the chaplet of divine mercy, which is set on the, the traditional rosary beads. Um, he talks about the novena of divine mercy, which starts on Good Friday and then ends the Sunday after Easter, which today we all know as the Feast of Divine Mercy. But he explained that that particular Sunday, the week after Easter, would be this time when all this grace would just, he would just pour out the floodgates of mercy on his people. And we would be forgiven not only for the sins we would confess, but any of the temporal punishment that goes along with sin. So any of that residual effect that lingers sometimes after our sinfulness, um, all of that would be, you know, completely wiped clean. So, um, and he gave us this image of divine mercy that we could gaze upon this image. It's the famous image of Jesus with those rays of white and red streaming from his heart, you know, and his head, hand raised in blessing and, and the words, Jesus, I trust in you. It's a very familiar image um, throughout the world, including our country. And if, as we gaze upon that, there's mercy available and grace is available for us there. He talks about the hour of mercy, which is three o'clock every day in the afternoon. That was, of course, when he was hanging on the cross originally, but a great time of mercy that's poured out during that special hour each day. So again, not a new message, like he didn't come and invent something new here, but just giving us new ways to receive it. Mm. You know, it's interesting to see the course, looking back on history, like um, you see, we have a Polish Pope, St. John Paul II. He mm-hmm. declares Divine Mercy Sunday. And then we have Pope Francis, who declared the Year of Mercy in December 8th, starting December 8th, 2015, then went to November of 2016. So you see, see this message of mercy constantly being reinforced in our church today. Mm-hmm. And it, the world really needs this impo- it's important message for our times right now. I believe that this message that was given in the 1930s was meant for our day and age. I really do. Uh, I just think the course that we've been heading on as a world moving farther and farther away from God, we move farther and farther away from hope. And, you know, we walk into this darkness, we become self-reliant, we end up disappointing ourselves because we're not the end all be all. We pursue everything but God and we're unhappy. Mm -hmm. And we Mm -hmm. have breakdowns of family. We have breakdowns of communities, of of nations, you know, and so it, it doesn't yield any positive fruit. But the message that Jesus was giving us is that no matter you know how hardened a person is, no matter how big their sins, his mercy always trumps that. His mercy outdoes that. So even the worst sinner that you can ever think of, a mass murderer or whatever, that person can turn back to Jesus and ask forgiveness and can be totally free and totally saved, you know, from eternal damnation. So it's a devotion that's extremely powerful and it is rescuing people. And as we look at 
how quickly this devotion did catch on. Now, you have to also understand that, you know, you may say, well, if it happened in the 1930s, how come I didn't find out about it till about maybe 10 years ago? And it's because the communists in Poland, they were trying to completely squelch Polish Catholicism because Catholicism in Poland was like a part of their heritage. It was more than just a religion. It was like their identity of who they were. I mean, it was like 98 percent Polish you know, Catholic country. So the communists were trying to squelch anything Catholic. And when they caught wind of this devotion that was getting you know traction in Poland, they tried to squelch it and they falsified some of the diaries that were being, um, you know, uh, promulgated, that's, you know, distributed. And it was a falsified diary that ended up at the Vatican. And that's why John the 23rd, back in like 1960, um, or early 60s, he, he actually banned the devotion because he got this errors. I mean, he could see the errors in the diary and he's like, this is not good. And so that's why it was banned. You know, first it was squelched and then it was banned. And it was John Paul, who you mentioned, um, when he comes into uh, church leadership, he's the one who reverses that ban, who lifts that ban because as a young Polish priest, he read the true diary mm -hmm. and he knew the true devotion of, of mercy. And he knew this was important. He was the one who lifted the ban, who gets this uh, cause in motion. And he is the one who will canonize Faustina in the year 2000 as the first saint of the uh, third millennium, the apostle of mercy, he calls her. her. He dies on the vigil of divine mercy himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he said in his whatever, how many years, 27 years of, of uh, as his pontificate, he said that bringing the divine mercy message to the world was the most important work he had done as Pope. Oh my gosh. So pretty that, impressive. You know, is. you were saying, you guys were both talking about how there's just such a need right now for mercy. And I think right now, because there's such a, you know, we, there's a lot of uh, lack of faith right now, and there's a lot of lukewarm souls. And that's one of the things that um, we pray specifically about in the novena for divine mercy. But what I think it's, it's so powerful because there are so many people right now who are dying as a lukewarm soul. But in the in the chaplet, he talks about, he Jesus says that if you say the chaplet in the presence of the dying, I, meaning Jesus, will stand between the Father and the dying person, not as the just judge, but as the merciful Savior. And I just think that's so powerful. So those of us who know the divine chaplet know that if you're if you can be by somebody's bedside that is potentially a lukewarm soul or a soul that needs this help, you know, this is a powerful thing. And it only takes five minutes to say. Yeah, it's very quick prayer. But it is like you say, it's very, very powerful, Chris. And, and absolutely, if you know someone personally, who maybe they're in hospice care, now they're, they're dying, you know, their time is limited, definitely say a chaplet. If you find out someone passed, I immediately say a chaplet because my thought is God's outside of time anyway. Oh, so right, right, so he's right. going to take point, that. Yeah. But anytime you pick up those rosary beads to do a chaplet, I always offer it for whoever's going to pass away this day, Lord, and especially, as you say, anyone who is lukewarm, has fallen away, who has mm -hmm. rejected you, you know, especially those, we all need this mercy, our, our hour of death, as they say, you know, will be, you can bet your bottom dollar that Satan's going to want to be in there that last hour yes. to try to tempt you mm -hmm. and discourage you. So we want that grace. I mean, I will be with you. I will stand, you know, with you at that, that moment in time. So of course we want that for ourselves and for everyone. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. If you're just joining us, of course, this is Catholic Women Now. We're speaking with Elizabeth Ficcicelli about St. Faustine and the Divine Mercy devotion and the, her diary. The other thing I was thinking about when you're talking about the de uh, on the on the um, at the bedside is, is it gives hope. I mean, mercy. This reading her diary, you think, oh, it's going to be mercy, and you think misery and suffering. But there's these little moments where she gives these little beautiful sniglets of hope and. When you're talking about this with the um, uh, someone you know who's maybe has is a lukewarm soul or their faith hasn't been strong and they're on their deathbed and you that gives you hope for them. Absolutely. You know, when I wrote that book, Therese Faustina and Bernadette, I was ascribing a virtue to each of those three, what I call my spiritual girlfriends. And for Faustina, I, I ascribed the virtue of hope because, you know, again, when I considered the time she lived in, in this country of Poland that was about to be invaded, uh, there there was, you know, war around them. You know, it was, the, I mean, they're, they're, their convent was threatened at times, you know, so they, it was very dark time, a very hopeless time. And, you know, yet she receives this message. Plus, she also was um, advised by the Lord that this devotion would meet resistance, you know, and this is exactly what would happen. So he said, but, but it will 
you know, it will survive and it will flourish. So, so she was given the hope that even though it would face that obstacle, that it would still flourish. And, you know, so I just, I, I look at that. I, I, she could have been a very hopeless person in the time for her country, for the time she lived in. Um, and for, you know, already secularism was starting to, to rear its ugly head in big ways there. So she was already seeing that movement. And yet she kind of hung on to that despite all odds, despite the ridicule from her sisters, or, or maybe not so much maybe outward ridicule as much as they probably shunned her a little bit, um, not having anyone to really Really understand her, whether it was confessors or superiors, and and just very feeling very alone in that. Um, but yet she hung on to this message of hope and knowing that this world needed it. And you know, I know up in heaven, you know, she must have just been so delighted to see you know what would come of it and what still comes of it. And it's so touching when I see little children doing that Divine Mercy mm-hmm. chaplet. You know, this is how popular the devotion has come today. That even the children know it. Or you know, even as simple as when you see that um, Divine Mercy see picture of Jesus or painting of Jesus. If you just say, Jesus, I trust in you. There's so many graces that come just from that short prayer as well. I know. And that, you know, those, those words, mm, those, you say, it's easy to say, Jesus, I trust in you. Of course I trust in Jesus. Why wouldn't I? But you know, when the rubber hits the road in your life and you're facing that cancer diagnosis or the unemployment situation or the wayward child or whatever, you know, and you want so desperately, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you want so desperately to control outcomes and Jesus, why aren't you showing up? You know, but that's the moment when we have to keep saying those words, Jesus, I trust in you. I don't understand it. I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel yet, but I trust in you. I know you're here. I know you're going to work this to good. Um, And we just cling to that trust. And that's what she did through all her temptations, you know, when the ugly one tried to tempt her and, and all her, she had a black night, you know, dark night of the soul. And yet she still hung on. Well, Elizabeth, you're you're tapping on my shoulder. I always need to be reminded of that. (laughs) Thank you. We all do. And I just think those words are comforting when you, if you say them slowly, Mm -hmm. Jesus, I Mm -hmm. trust in you. Mm -hmm. That's comforting. Yeah. To really mean it to, to really, really mean to it know that it. yeah and that he will honor his you know he gives his promises i mean mm-hmm. he keeps his promise to us um one more thing here elizabeth we're getting close to the end of the time can you share a you know a divine mercy miracle here um to give us a little more hope going here yeah, I mean, my, my Divine Mercy miracle was in the confessional, and, and I had been struggling with that as a new Catholic and really didn't get that sacrament. And, and I had been just finding out about Faustina and Divine Mercy. It was in the mid-90s, so she wasn't that popular yet. But I was doing the devotion in the chaplet and had the image and all that and was preparing for that confession after Easter. And I had a situation come up right then in Holy Week that I, I just did something that was really horrible, and I knew I had to get to confession, and it was a very important moment in my life. And even though I dragged myself to confession and I, and I was ad- admitting what I had done, I'm feeling terrible. I was crying. I was awful. I, I was still in that stuck position where I wasn't forgiving myself. I wasn't feeling um, God's forgiveness because I still was so messed up about confession. I didn't understand it was Jesus was there. It was an encounter with, you know, the living God because it's a sacrament and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, um, as I was stepping out of the confessional, still feeling terrible about what I had done, this great miracle happened in that I felt this tangible, physical washing feeling come over me. And I remembered the words Jesus said to Faustina when he said, I want to pour my ocean of mercy out on my sinners. And in that very tangible way, I felt the Lord just pouring out his mercy to let me know he heard my confession and I was forgiven. And it just completely unburdened me in a moment. I mean, I was just feeling light and like giddy and it was incredible transformation. Mm -hmm. And that was my miracle that enabled me then to go out and first of all, embrace the sacrament for the great treasure it is, but then to go and speak on it and write on it and bring so many other souls to that sacrament, which we can all start again. That's the fount of mercy right there is is our confession. I'm having an inspiration as I'm sitting here listening to you. I'm thinking, you know where we need to have that picture with the words, I trust in you below it hung in every in the prison. Confessional. Yeah. Well, in every prison. Oh, prison. Yeah. yeah. Every prison. prison. Yeah. J- yeah. You know, and somebody's going to ask what's that all about? You know, they're at least going to read it. They're going to pray it and not even realize it. Well, just because the, and just the words are under there. Mm-hmm. And I think that image is very powerful because you have those rays coming from his heart. It's the blood and the mm-hmm. water from the side of Christ mm-hmm. coming out from his heart. And those rays, I remember Father Michael Gately talking about his um, father was not a very nominal Catholic. And he kind of started doing this devotion. And he'd say to, <laughs> he'd say to Father Michael, those rays, those rays, they're getting to me. Those rays, there's something to them. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's true. Oh, anyway, so, so funny. Well, and that makes sense of why she's become your one of your best friends. She has. Um, she's just. She's taught me so much about mercy, and that's the other part of the equation. Yes, we want to pull down God's mercy for us. Of course, that's wonderful. But then we're also called to take that mercy out to others, and we're called to be merciful people, and that's also needed. You know, person to person mercy is very much needed in this day and age too. So that's part of it is to to take advantage of God's mercy that He wants to give us so freely. But then, as we turn to him with trust, receive that mercy, we let it flow from us to those around us. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. Mm. Amen. That's a great thought to go out on here, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, if people want to get a hold of you, what's your website real quick here? Sure. It's elizabethficicelli.com and I'd love to come out and speak or my books are there, my, my media work and so All right. check it out. All right. Well, thank you so much. Keep up that good work for Jesus and the Divine Mercy Chaplet and <laughs> devotion. <laughs> All right. God bless, ladies. Great Have talking great with you. God bless. Well, we are grateful here at Catholic Women for the support of Fred Haas Law Offices. You know, if I ever needed an attorney for to represent me in a personal injury, Mr. Haas is the man I would call. He gives personal attention to his clients, and he provides highly competent counsel. He is an honest man and treats everyone with the utmost respect. And he's a member of St. Mary's of Nazareth Parish. And um, I, I've been told he goes to daily mass over there. Yeah, and you know what? Say, I love seeing him on TV when they say Fred Haas, double D dot com. I love that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's based in Des Moines, but he serves clients throughout all all of Iowa, 515-256-6301 or 888-338-6535. FredHaas.com. Fred double D, Haas double A. Well, let's close out in prayer. Let's do that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Merciful Jesus, we trust in you. Pour your oceans of mercy upon our world, upon our hearts, upon our loved ones. May our hearts be open to your mercy and may we come to you in the fullness of hope, joy, and renewal that we can be loving, we can be merciful, and we can just, our souls can just come alive in your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Amen. Amen. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, the Iowa Catholic Radio Rosary is up next. Stay tuned. And thank you for listening. We ask that you please consider making a tax-deductible donation to Iowa Catholic Radio as we continue to teach, evangelize, and defend our Catholic faith. And we're looking forward to seeing all of you at the Ladies' Mosaic Luncheon later this morning. That's right. St. Augustine's at noon. That's right. Well, this, the Iowa Catholic Radio Rosary is next. Now go do impossible things with God. Talking about the things that matter most to you. Today's Catholic Women. Catholic Women Now with Julie Nelson and Chris McGruder is underwritten by Fred Haas. Over 30 years helping injured Iowans recover losses from accidents and work-related injuries. Fred Double D, Haas Double A. Learning Rx, finding the right solution to give your child a foundation that can last a lifetime. And Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte, a licensed representative of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa. CindySchulte.com. Catholic Women Now with Julie Nelson and Chris McGruder every Thursday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on the radio voice for Catholic Women Now. 1150 a.m., 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM, Iowa Catholic Radio.